Across America and around the world, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, Ralph Epperson, take three. Folks, have we been bamboozled? Is Superman? Is Superman the model for the new group race of the new world order? Well, tonight we're going to find out as we find out just exactly who these people are in their own words as Ralph Epperson reads from his little magic book that convinces people, yes, there is a conspiracy and these are the people who are carrying it out. Welcome, Ralph, to the hour of the time. Well, thanks very much, Bill. It's a real pleasure to be with you and your listeners again today for hour number three of our of our discussion of the New World Order. You've got uh, a little magic book there with you uh, <laughs> that incriminates a few people, doesn't it? Well, what I've done, Bill, is I've accumulated a series of, uh, of quotes out of various books. I've actually photographed the exact page on my photo machine and photocopier in Tucson. And uh, so I just thought we could go through these one after the other and uh, discuss in their own literature to prove our contentions. These things will prove that what you and I have been talking about for years. Okay, folks. Now, you heard that. Now, you know what you're supposed to do when you listen to this show. You should have a tablet, a paper beside you, a pen or a pencil. And as we go through this, Ralph is going to give the name of the book, the exact page that the information is found upon, and um, he might even give you the paragraph. But he's going to quote from their own words. And uh, we're just going to do a whole hour of this and see if we can't uh, put a noose around somebody's neck. And maybe if all of you out there pull hard enough, uh, we can get rid of the New World Order in short shrift. Uh, Ralph, why don't you go ahead and start? Well, it might be a good place to start uh, with the speech that was given in October, in fact, on October the 27th, 1941, by Franklin Roosevelt. As you know, this was just before World War II, uh, which started shortly after uh, the Pearl Harbor event in uh, December of 1941. So Roosevelt went on nationwide radio to tell us about the New World Order. I want to read this quote, just about two paragraphs. Hitler has often protested, and let's identify Hitler as meaning the head of the German government who was starting World War II. Hitler has often protested that his plans for conquest do not extend across the Atlantic Ocean, but his submarines and raiders prove otherwise, and so does the entire design of his New World Order. I have in my possession a secret map made by Germany, but in Germany rather, by Hitler's government, by the planners of the New World Order. And your government has in its possession another document, a document made in Germany by Hitler's government. It is a detailed plan which, for obvious reasons, the Nazis do not wish to publicize just yet, but which they are ready to impose a little later on a dominated world if Hitler wins. And then this is the key. It, this plan, it is a plan of Hitler to abolish all existing religions. Now, where did you find that quote, Ralph? That quote is in a book called The Vital Speeches of the Day, published in uh, New York City, um, it's in November 15, 1941, volume 8, uh, page number 3. Now, you talked about New World Order there. Hitler talked about the New World Order? Yes, exactly. You yeah. mean that's not something that George Bush just made up off the top of his head to get the American people to go, to, go along with Desert Storm? No. No, he's talking here about the same identical New World Order that George Bush wants. The New World Order is out to abolish all existing religions. So what Mr. Roosevelt was telling us is absolutely accurate. And I want you to know in one simple sentence that the, the New World Order of Adolf Hitler is no different than the New World Order of, of George Bush. And wow, you're the only one besides me who's ever made that statement. <laughs> now, all of you people out there who, uh, who thought that uh, Bill Cooper wasn't quite leveling with you, now you've heard it from somebody else. And, and it's the truth. Go well, ahead, Ralph. Roosevelt's right on target. He's telling us the truth. Uh, the New World Order is out to destroy all organized religions. Now, this is a quote from Morals and Dogma, page 734. Morals and Dogma now is kind of like the, uh, it's the book they give to new recruits in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, or at least they used to, didn't they? That's correct. That's, that is the contention made uh, that the book is no longer being given to the Masons at the 14th degree. I was in the Masonic Lodge building in Tucson. I'm, I want to share with you, I'm not a Mason, never been a Mason, but I went there one day to do some research. I couldn't find Mackey's Encyclopedia at the University of Arizona, so I went in, I called the uh, lodge. That's because I got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe so. That might be where it was. So I went to, uh, to uh, in 1985, went to the uh, Scottish Rite uh, Temple, as they called it, in Tucson. I called ahead and asked if I could come in and look for Mackey's. They said yes. So when I got in there, I, uh, I did some reading, 
And the, a couple of Masons came in the room and wanted to know who I was and why I was curious, and I didn't want to tell them. <laughs> I just said, I'm curious. I just want to know more about Masonry. So they asked why, and I said, I'm just doing uh, reading and researching on the study of Masonry. At that time, in 1985, he went behind the counter and showed me a copy of the Morals and Dogma that they said they gave to every Mason at the 14th degree. Now, Rex Hutchins has written a book called A Bridge to Life, and in there he says that they no longer give this book to the Masons at the 14th degree. Now, you can take whichever choice, uh, uh, position you choose. Uh, I well, it, it may be that, the, that certain lodges did and certain lodges didn't, or, or maybe all of them did at one time, and now maybe only a few lodges do. Uh, independent lodges do have a lot of leeway to act independently as long as they don't violate the Constitution of the Scottish Rite of, of Freemasonry or the Constitution of their lodge. Well, let's talk about who the author was, Bill. I know you've told your listeners who the author of the book Morals and Dogma was, and oh, yes. how significant he was, but just for those who maybe have never heard this before, uh, Morals and Dogma was written in 1871 by Albert Pike. And Albert Pike was the sovereign grand commander of Freemasonry from 18. 69, I believe, to 1891. For some 32 years of his life, this was the number one Mason in the world, Albert Pike. So this book can be relied upon as being authentic. It was published by the 33rd Degree Council in Washington, D.C. This is their book. There's no question about the authenticity of what I'm about to read to you. It's on page 734 of Morals and Dogma. There is in nature one most potent force, by means whereof a single man who could possess himself of it could revolutionize and change the face of the world. This force was known to the ancients. It was adored in the secret rites of the temple under the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet or the Hermaphrodite goat of Mendes. It is the serpent devouring his own tail. Let's talk about the secret rites of the temple that is, the Masons, and then they trace their history back, as you know, and we'll prove as we continue through this, all the way back to the very beginning of time, the early ancient temples of the sun worship, etc. He said it is a, uh, a, a worship of the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet. Baphomet, I've seen drawings of him, is a drawing of a goat-headed uh, devil. He's, uh, as they said here, he's hermit, I can have pronounce this word, hermaph. Hermaphrodite. Yes, that means he's both male and female. This is the androgynous god of old that took the form of the goat or the ram when uh, the sun was in the house of the goat or the ram and uh, was worshipped actually in the main, uh, uh, the most famous place where, where this god was worshipped was in Mendes at the temple of Mendes. And Baphomet surfaces later, and I'm sure we're going to get to that, in the Legend of the Knights Templars, which, folks, we've proven on this show time and time again is no legend at all. Okay, then lastly he said, it, this force, is the serpent devouring its own tail. So he's talking here once again about the, the, the serpent and the serpent worship that's worldwide 6,000 years old. The next thing I wanted to bring to your attention is the uh, Holy Bible that I have, a copy of, uh, it was given to me by a fellow who got one himself, uh, he's not a mason, at least he told me he was not, but I have a, a, in front of me a copy of the, the cover of this Bible, and there's a picture of uh, what appears to be Jesus confounding the uh, priests or the Sadducees, wherever it was, in the temple, and then down in the lower right-hand corner there's a star with one point down. It's a five-pointed star, and the one point is pointing down, and two points are pointing up. Now, this is the symbol of the Eastern Star, uh, but this Bible is indeed a Masonic Bible, and the, the cover of it, I saw, Bill, in your, uh, in your uh, library, you have a copy of the same Bible. On your particular copy, it's a uh, square in the compass. Apparently, this particular Bible was intended to be given to the women in the Eastern Star, because the Eastern Star uh, uh, is shown on the cover upside down. Now, I want to talk about what it means when the star is one point down and two points up, I have a copy of a book, and all I have in front of me is the uh, cover of it. It's a copy of a book called History of Freemasonry and Concordant Orders. The book was published in 1891 by the, uh, by the board, uh, written by a board of editors and published by the Fraternity Publishing Company in London, England in 1891. Why don't you give the, uh, the name of that uh, book just one more time, just to make sure everybody gets a chance to write it out. My readers uh, like to check us out, and, yeah. and I encourage them, in fact, our... Uh, our uh, rule on this show is not to believe anything that anybody says or anything that anybody reads, no matter who wrote it, unless you can check it out for yourself. So most of our listeners do that. Good. The name of the book is called History 
of Freemasonry and Concordant Orders. It was published, uh, in fact it says, History of the Ancient and Honorable Fraternity of Free and Accepted Freemasons and Concordant Orders, illustrated, written by a board of editors, uh, Boston and New York, USA, the Fraternity Publishing Company, London, England, 1891. Now this book, uh, the uh, on page uh, Roman numeral 3, meaning III, it shows the board of editors. There's probably 70 names here, I believe, all of which are high-ranking 32nd or 33rd degree Masons. Each one is listed by name, his degree, and where he comes from. So this book is a compilation of the writings of maybe 70 different high-ranking Masons. Well, 70 is, is also a significant number when you look at the makeup of the priesthood of the Temple of Solomon and also the Mormon Church. That's correct. Now, let's go here now to page 49 of that book. Uh, Bill, you'll have to trust me, but if you want to look at this as well, you can confirm it. And here on this page, 49 of this book, there's the caption on the top is the divine plan. We have a drawing of the two stars, one with the traditional one point up and the two points down. And then you reverse it over and you show two points up and one point down. And lo and behold, we see... Inside the drawing of the uh, one star, one the star with the one point down is the drawing of a goat. The beard is his uh, the lower point. His two ears are the two right angles, and his uh, two horns are the two points looking up. It's hard to describe, of course, the drawing of a star. And this is, in fact, the goat of Menzies. Exactly. There's no question. Or Baphomet. Baphomet is right here on page 49 of this book that we just described. I'm going to read you a short paragraph on page 49. It reads as follows. This star represents God, all that is pure, virtuous, and good, when represented with one point upward. So when the point goes up, meaning the two points are down, mm -hmm. the traditional version that we see everywhere around the world, that represents God with a capital G, uh, with re uh, all that is pure, virtuous, and good. Uh, then it says, but when turned with one point down, it represents evil, all that is opposed to the good, pure and virtuous, in fine, it represents the goat of Mendes. And this is the symbol of the female or women's branch of Freemasonry called the Order of the Eastern Star. Yes. And you just read that, and I've witnessed this, that this came right out of a book written and published by Freemasons. Yes. In other words, they are admitting that when the, part, the star is turned over and one point down, it, quote, is opposed to the good, pure and virtuous, in fine, it represents the goat of Mendes. Correct. Was, here we have a documented evidence that the eastern star is one point down and it means the goat of Mendes. The goat of Mendes is, as you just read, Baphomet and you name it. Also absolute proof, I should say more absolute proof, piled upon all the other absolute proof that we put out to you that Freemasons are, are liars. They've been lying to us all the time. And uh, uh, now, most Freemasons on the lower level of this pyramidal structure of organization are just a bunch of fools who join something that they know nothing about, thinking that they're going to get benefits out of this, and they do, material benefits. The spiritual, however, is a vacuum, and uh, they're held there uh, by the, uh, the these uh, supposed brotherhood friendships and uh, dedication to the order and the material benefits they get through their interaction in business with their with their fellow Masons, uh, and there are real rewards. If a, judge, if a Mason, Masonic judge is sitting on the, on the bench and uh, you go into court and you're a Mason and the person facing you in that court is not a Freemason, uh, you won your case before, before anybody even opens their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, continue, Ralph. This is really interesting. I hope you're all taking notes, and I hope you look these uh, publications up, and I hope you verify everything that you're hearing here and everything that you've heard in the past and, of course, will hear in the future. Okay. The next thing, that, these are all pretty much at random, Bill. They're just in sequence. I put them in alphabetical order, so they're, they're nothing to do with any consistent plan. That's okay. We're, we're just reading one after the other to document the case that what Bill has been saying and what I've been saying about the Masons and what they're involved with is legitimate. We can read it from their own material. Now, this particular quote comes from page 786 of Morals and Dogma. Page 786 of Morals and Dogma. It's going to talk about the colors represented in the hall, inside the lodge. The hall, uh, in this degree, uh, this is probably later on, in one of the later degrees, I don't have the, the, the entire title here. It says, in this degree, the columns are white with black and red. The hangings are black and over that crimson. The colors black, white, and crimson, meaning red, appear in the clothing, and the key and balance are among the symbols. 
So here we have an admission that black and red and white are the three major colors of the Masonic Lodge. And I want you to build in your mind and all your listeners in their mind, picture the Nazi flag that we saw during World War II. It was a, it was a red uh, flag with a white circle in it. Uh, representing probably about oh, maybe two thirds of the uh, of the flag, and then inside that was the black swastika. That's correct. And now the the white circle, of course, represents the sun. The swastika is a sun symbol, which we'll also confirm later. But the three colors in the Nazi flag were red, black, and white. And here we learn that in seven eight, on page seven eighty six of the Masonic Lodge, the colors black, white, and red are, are represented throughout the lodge, throughout the temple, uh, everywhere. Now, I have something to add to that. I have an 1898 edition of Mackey's uh, History of Freemasonry. And it's seven volumes, of which I have six of the volumes. Volume two is missing. And by the way, if any of you can find uh, a volume two of uh, any 1890 edition of, of Albert Mackey's uh, History of Freemasonry, um, I'd be willing to purchase that from you. Uh, because that's the only volume that I'm lacking. But in this uh, in this set uh, of uh, the history of Freemasonry, published by Albert Mackey, uh, who is the ultimate historian for Freemasonry, uh, they have a section on crosses. Now, the thing that's really significant here is only one cross is listed, and they devote eight pages of this history of Freemasonry to this one cross, and that cross is the swastika, and they attribute an Aryan origin to it, and in this eight pages, and elsewhere in the history of Freemasonry, and also in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and many of their other books, they admit that they are an Aryan organization based upon the fact that the Aryan race is superior to all others, they are racist, and the swastika is their symbol. Well, I just found in this particular case, I agree with what you're saying. I know about the swastika, and we'll maybe even find some of the references to it later on in our readings today. Uh, but the, here we're talking about the colors, black, red, and white. You see those three colors around the world as being the colors of many of the communist and socialist flags around the world. Black, red, and white. It's very common. So I thought that might was kind of interesting. The Masons admit those are their three colors. Now, this is from a, a, a book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manley P. Hall. Manley P. Hall is uh, a 33rd degree Mason. When he died a few years ago, the Masons acknowledged him as being one of the great, uh, quote, philosophers, which means writers and researchers in their terms, of uh, Freemasonry. This is on page 100 of his book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manley P. Hall. Because this shows us, shows the world just how important Masonry is. You and I have been taught by the uh, Masons that they're nothing more than a group who meets on Thursday nights or wherever night they meet. And they, uh, they, uh, they put clown costumes on and uh, have burn centers, etc. We're just a fraternal organization existing <laughs> for the good of your community. <laughs> okay, and if you believe that, you really are a sheeple. <laughs> well, let's, let's read what they say, how powerful they are. Listen to this. This is page 100 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Quote, Masonry is an ordainer of kings. Now, what's an ordainer of a king? That's the man that puts him on the throne. That's correct. Masonry is an ordainer of kings. Its hand has shaped the destinies of worlds. So this is not a little lodge on Thursday night. It's not out there to build burn centers and hospitals for the, for the children. This is an ordainer of kings, and its hand has shaped the destinies of worlds. That's power. We're just a fraternal organization existing for the good of your community. <laughs> now, let's read this one. This is another book by Manley P. Hall that further talks about the power of the Masonic Lodge. This is a book called What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples. I'll repeat it again. What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples, written by Manley P. Hall. This is on page 58. Listen to this quote. The ancient initiates are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth, and men are but marionettes, dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. We see the dancer, but the mastermind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence. Does that sound like a lodge that meets on Thursday night? Not to me it doesn't. Not at all. But now, folks, with bearing that in mind and understanding that Walt Disney was a member of this secret college, this hidden fraternity, 
Go watch Pinocchio again. Go watch Pinocchio again and understand that when he was just the wooden puppet made by his master or father, Geppetto, that he was you. And he received the gift of the morning star, Lucifer, and listen to that song again, When You Wish Upon a Star, and then watch what happens to Pinocchio as he becomes an initiate of the hidden order. And this is what your children are being indoctrinated in. And then go back and look at a whole bunch of the other things that Walt Disney put out that your children are watching and uh, understand. Read the new biography that's out on Walt Disney, which I haven't read yet, but I've, I've derived all this information from my own research. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in the intelligence community. Every time they held a, a top-level secret scientific meeting where they discussed the exploration of space, representatives of Walt Disney Studios attended, and I can prove that and document it. But go ahead. I just want to show you how insidious these people are. Go ahead, Ralph. I'd like to, if I may, Bill, reread that quote. I want you to see exactly what, what, they're, what they're saying and also what they think of us, the average American, the person who sits by and believes the Masons are a group of uh, men who meet on Thursday. Nice. The ancient initiates, now the Masons acknowledge, as you know, Bill, and I know as well, they acknowledge their history back to the ancient initiation ceremonies of the ancient pyramids, etc. So the ancient initiates, meaning them as well, current, from them now to current, Absolutely. are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth. So the ancient initiates are behind the government that you and I see on the surface. And men are but marionettes. Who's that? Who is they? Who are they talking about? They're talking about you and I. We are marionettes dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. Bah. <laughs> bah. He said, we see the dancer, but the mastermind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence. Now, folks, don't feel bad, because most of my life I was in the same situation that a lot of you find yourself in now just learning about this and saying, gee, how could I be so dumb? How could, how could I be so blind? How could they be doing this to me and to everyone else? Uh, we, all, we all have to face that somewhere in our life. And we all have to recognize that we've been very stupid, very ignorant, very apathetic, and we have to uh, face that fault within ourselves and, and make a vow to change that and change it right now and never let it happen again. This is the purpose of this show, is to wake the sheeple empower the people, give you powerful tools, show you that you have everything within yourself that it takes to turn this around. You don't need Trojan horse leaders. You don't need to look for some knight in shining armor riding up on a white horse to save you. If you're one of those people, then you're doomed because there aren't any people who are going to come and save you. You have to save yourself. Wake the sheeple, empower the people, and once that's done, then we together can save freedom for the world. And Ralph is one of the great warriors out here on the battlefield standing with me fighting this battle that many of you never even knew uh, was, was going on. Okay, let's keep going. This is not written by a, a mason, but it's written by one who knows about the mason. This is the book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy by Alice Bailey. Now, I do not know when this book was published. It doesn't say, as far as I can tell, but I believe, Bill, you probably confirmed. I think she wrote around 1920, something that neighborhood. Yeah, and she used to publish a newspaper called the, 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 uh, Lucifer. Yeah. And uh, she was, at one time, the head of Lucifer's Trust. Uh, yeah, on, if I may, we'll cover that right now. The, uh, on the bottom of this cover, the book, that I have the, 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 what they call the furnace piece, Xerox, for this book that I've got in my hand, it says that this was published by the Lucis, L-U-C-I-S, publishing company in uh, New York, uh, United Nations Plaza in New York, and also the Lucis Press Limited in London. And the word Lucis is Latin for Lucifer. They used to call the publishing company the Lucifer Publishing Company. That's correct, until uh, a lot of people came down around their ears about that, and their offices were and still are in the United Nations building in New York. Okay, so this book is published by uh, the Lucis, Lucis uh, Publishing Company out of New York and London. This is page 6, 
1.70 of the book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy. If I may, let's just lay this groundwork down. What she's trying to do by this book is bring them out. She says the externalization, meaning make them visible. Yes, she wants to bring the hidden college out into the open. And a lot of people have talked about this. And In fact, even the man who, who, um, who was uh, President Clinton's mentor, uh, Carol uh, Quigley. Quigley, who wrote uh, Tragedy and Hope, said that the only thing he disagreed about their plan, and he was in, in concert with their plan to take over the world, the only thing he disagreed with is that they were doing it in secret. Yes, exactly. Okay, now here's page 670, just one quick paragraph. It's uh, I think <laughs> one sentence, one long sentence long. The one thing which humanity needs today is the realization that there is a plan which is definitely working out through all world happenings, and that all that has occurred in man's historical past, past and all that has happened lately is assuredly in line with that plan. That's correct. And I might want to uh, remind you all that one of the greatest backers who, who really gave Bo Grice his financial start was a man named Paul Fisher, who was a very highly degreed Freemason, who wrote a book also called The Plan. And in his book, he outlined a plan for putting in a new government in the United States of America, which would be a scientific government. Do away with our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and change the whole form of government throughout the world. You've got to wake up. You must wake up. If you don't, then why don't you just reach down and put the chains on your own ankles and save everybody a lot of trouble? Well, going back to Alice Bailey, she's saying that everything that's happened, the major events of the past, are in accordance with the plan run by these initiatives. That's as, correct. As and you can, you can trace this plan and people talking about this plan all the way back to the ancient Egyptian temples of initiation in ancient sure. Cairo. And then we just learned that. The ancient initiates are involved in this plan. So we're seeing, once again, these people trace their own history back to the very beginnings of time. That's correct. And the Masons accept that as well. They claim that they trace their history back to this ancient mystery religion. Now, this is from the book entitled The... Uh, the uh, Let's see, this is from uh, 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 Manly, I'm sorry, no, Manly. Rex Hudson's book called The Bridge to Light. This is page 150. This book, re this is not talking about the eagle. Uh, as you know, Bill, the eagle is the national symbol of America. It's on the right-hand side of the back of the dollar bill. Uh, by the way, those of you that have the ability to uh, magnify that, uh, that eagle I'll drawn on the back of our great seal might find it of some interest if you can count the feathers. On the right wing, there's 32, and on the left wing, there's 33. And I know people say that's some sure we're a coincidence, or the artist made a mistake. Oh, and yeah, <laughs> this is coincidence. Uh, 32 degrees is the highest number of degrees in the, in, uh, the Scottish you. Rite of Freemasonry, and the 33rd degree is the meritorious degree uh, given for work toward the furtherance of the great plan. Yeah, that's great exactly plan. what that degree is awarded yes. for, and that's what Bo Grice is working for now, if he hasn't already achieved it. Uh, because he said at Freedom Call 90 in Las Vegas at the Showboat Hotel when he introduced himself that he was, and I quote, a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite, okay. unquote. Let's go back to the Eagle. This is on page 150 of the book entitled The uh, Bridge to Light, written by Rex Hutchins. The, this emblem, meaning the Eagle, is of great antiquity, figuring in the symbolic inventory of the Egyptians as the sun. As wisdom is attained through reason, the eagle is also symbolic of reason. Page 150 of Rex Hutch's book. Okay, hold that thought because we've got to take our break now. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, Ralph, this is a memorable series, and I'm sure that our listeners are not going to forget your guest appearance on the hour of the time for five nights in a row <laughs> for uh, quite a while. Uh, because uh, you're really bringing to their ears some verification of a lot of the things that I've been telling them for many months, over a year now. And uh, you had, you didn't get any of this from me, did you? No, no. This is, once again, Bill, we're reading this from their own literature. You, you can't argue with the sources. These are, from, these are their legitimate books that they publish, they tell us, they acknowledge. 
Uh, in fact, Rex Hutchins himself gave me this copy of the book. I made him do something. By the way, it's interesting. Rex, Rex's book was published when he was a 32nd degree. After he published this book, or the, the 33rd degree council published his book, uh, I've been told that Rex became a 33rd degree mason, so Rex has now been illuminated. He lives in Tucson, by the way. The interesting guest, if you could ever get him to do it, I don't think he will. I want to apologize to you all out there for that little coughing fit. I breathed when I should have swallowed when I took a drink of coffee, um, so please forgive me. Okay, let's continue with another quote from Rex's book uh, entitled The Bridge to Light. On page 142, he continues to discuss the... Uh, eagle as a symbol of the, of the Masons and of the ancient initiates. He says the eagle, one page 142, the eagle also represented the great Egyptian sun god, Amon Ra. It is the symbol of the infinite supreme reason or I intelligence. So here we see once again a connection back of the eagle, back very back to the very beginning worship of Amon Ra, the sun god. And there's also this thought about the uh, intelligence reason. Uh, this, this is throughout their literature. You can find it constantly references of the of the eagle back to the sun guy, etc. Well, this is connected with their with their Luciferian philosophy that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God and was set free from this bondage by uh, Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect, primordial knowing, and that's what that's all about. They believe that Satan told them the truth that man surely will not die if he eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and will, in fact, himself become God. That's correct. And that's the promise of all these, these mystery religions and even of the Mormon church. That's correct. Okay, now we're going back to the book entitled What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples by Manly P. Hall, page, one, uh, page 23. Here's what he said. In the remote past, the gods, pearl, small g gods, walked with man. These they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods. They left the keys of their great wisdom, which was the knowledge of good and evil. So here, once again, we're back to the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where it all starts. And all of you people out there who all your life have been sitting around saying, religion is a joke, it doesn't mean anything. Let me tell you something. It may be a joke to you. You may be an atheist. You may not even believe in God. But if the people who hold the power the power to make nations rise and fall, the power to make armies march at their beck, to, to chop off your head if they want to in the dead of night. If they believe it, then it's not a bunch of bunk, folks. It's something that you need to understand and know. And from my own personal point of view, if you don't believe in God, you have no protection from what's coming whatsoever. Okay, now, once again, we're going to continue with this thought. I've got a couple of quotes, I guess, on this good and evil. This is from page 844 of Morals and Dogma. Another, uh, this is written by Albert Pike, another great Masonic writer. Here's what he's got. Now, he's reading this particular quote is in parentheses, in quotation. So I'll read that first, and then we'll continue. Quote, ye shall be like the Elohim, knowing good and evil. That's in quotes and in italics. That thought, had the serpent of Genesis said... And the tree of knowledge became the tree of death. Notice what he said. Mm -hmm. that, Lucifer, that God gave us the tree of, of uh, the knowledge of good and evil and told us not to eat from there because if we did, we would become as God. Well, he said if we did, we would surely die yes. and would become as God knowing Good and evil. The difference between good and evil. So what, what God was doing was saying to mankind in the Garden of Eden, I am going to teach you what is right and wrong. You are not to decide, because when you do, as we know, you mess it up. Like Adolf Hitler decided he knew what was good and evil. Yeah. So what we're saying here is that the, the purpose of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Bible was to, to allow man to be free, but under the guidance and of the truth of the Bible, the truths meaning the moral absolutes. So here we now have this tree now becoming the tree of death. That's correct. For 6,000 years, going back now, this is a continuation of the quote on page 844 of Morals and Dogma. For 6,000 years, the martyrs of knowledge, who are those? That's us. Toil and die at the foot of this tree, that it may again become the tree of life. So what they're saying is that they're hoping that after 6,000 years, they will allow this tree, us, to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. That it will no longer be the tree of death, but the tree of life. And there's another distinction here that that is the basis for all of the misinterpretation of this by these people is that God said, 
If ye eat of the fruit of the tree of life, ye shall surely die and become as gods, and that you will know the difference between good mm -hmm. and evil. Now, he didn't say man will become God. He said man will be as God in the fact that he will know the difference between good and evil. He didn't say that man was going to become God, and he said the promise is that you will surely die. Now, the promise of Satan uh, to Adam and Eve was that you will not die, and you will become gods. And that's what these people believe. And it is false. It is a lie. And, um, well, if you don't believe me, just watch Shirley MacLaine as she grows old and dies while she's insisting that she's God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that in her movie that they showed on television. She stands by the edge of the lake or the river or ocean, wherever it is, with your arms outstretched, shouting, I am God. Yes. I love to ask those people that believe that. I say, listen, I'll tell you what you do. Why don't you get all of you together that believe that, and next Thursday morning create a new universe. Do it all together. All of you together. create anything. Yeah, <laughs> like, make, make a new universe. In fact, we'll move the other, move the other one over and make, make a new one. Let's continue now, once again, with this thought about good and evil. This is from page 169 of Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike. He says, the true use of knowledge is to distinguish good from evil. So once again, we are to use our mind to decide for ourselves what is good and evil. That's, That's what right. Is. Now we're just continuing somewhat at random. This is from the book entitled The Secret Destiny of America, written by Manny P. Hall. This is on, the, uh, on page 14 of the book. In the very beginning it says, we're talking here about the Great Seal of the United States, the design on the reverse of the Great Seal. Now let's carefully uh, point out what that is. The reverse side is the one with the pyramid in the eye and the uh, phrases annuit septus and nobus oris accord. So he says the design on the reverse of the great seal is even more definitely related to the order of the quest. The pyramid and the all-seeing eye represent the universal house surmounted by the radiant symbol of the great architect of the universe. That's right. And, re and notice, folks, he said the order of the quest. Where have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. If you read my book, I mean, I make, it, I make the point that the people behind this call themselves uh, uh, the, the members of the Order of the Quest. Okay. So the Order Amongst of the Quest. Amongst other things. Yeah, they were the ones that brought, brought America, uh, created, actually created America. That's they were right. the ones who set this nation up, according to Manly P. Hall. Notice, by the way, the title of his book. It's called The Secret Destiny of America. Mm -hmm. And you say, wait a minute, this is, what do you mean secret destiny? This is the land of the three, you know, the we the people, by the people, for the people? <laughs> no, no. You mean we're not determining our, our own future? Yeah. It's, it's, it's already been determined for us? That's what man is all saying. That's and exactly yet, the truth. <laughs> and we Americans stand by and allow this to go by unnoticed. It is bizarre. Here's, he's telling us we have a secret destiny. He knows what it is. He knows who's bringing it to us. We've already seen they, they, they're mocking us by calling us men or marionettes. We see the dancer, but we don't see the one pulling the strings, meaning on us. And we allow this. And then when you and I come along and try to point it out, we're the ones brought under uh, under <laughs> the service. Right. But they mock us all the time because they think we're too stupid to figure it out. Oliver Stone and uh, Fletcher Prouty were mocking us in the movie JFK when they asked the question, who killed Kennedy? And then uh, back off and show us the Washington Monument, exactly. which answers the question. Uh, they mock us when they put the eternal flame, which is the symbol of their God, the fire, the sun, the light, Lucifer, on the grave of our fallen president. And I can go on and on and on and on. They've been throwing it on our face uh, for centuries. And we're just now beginning. Some of us are, are not sheep anymore. Uh, and we're, we're, we're just now beginning to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and uh, wake up to our own potentials and our own powers and uh, that's what we want to do. We want to wake you up. We want to empower you. We want to show you the, the reality compared to the fantasy world that you've been living in all your life. And we want you to get out here on the battlefield with Ralph and I and many other real patriots, not Trojan horses, uh, whom you've been following for most of your lives. Okay, once again, now we're going to continue with our subject of the Great Seal. This is once again written from The Secret Destiny of America. This particular quote is on pages 177 and 178 of The Secret Destiny of America, written by Manley Palmer Hall, 33rd Degree Mason. But if this design on the obverse side, now the obverse side is the one with the, the pyramid and the, uh, I'm sorry, the obverse side is the one with the, the eagle. The eagle. The right. reverse is the pyramid. That's correct. So we'll go back. If the design on the obverse side, meaning the eagle side, of the seal is stamped with the signature of the order of the quest, the design on the reverse 
is even more definitely related to the old mysteries. Absolutely. So that's what we got to understand. That the eagle is only a symbol of the sun god. What's this pyramid all about? What's the eye all about? Why the Latin phrases? He's saying that side has far more significance to our secret destiny than does the eagle side. It certainly does. And for those of you who have attended any of my workshops or lectures, I have shown you what the, the uh, order of the trapezoid uh, works out to in a formula uh, which in the New Age movement is called the pyramid. Under the pyramid, uh, when something is created, its opposite is always crea is created at the same time. So the semblance of really creating this country under God, which they didn't, it was not the God that you thought it was, it was really the God which they worship, Lucifer, uh, created the exact opposite, uh, which you have to see this worked out. But um, it, it's on my tape, uh, the Atlanta, Georgia tape, which is seven hours long, uh, for those of you who are interested, send for an info pack, and we'll send you information on that. And by the way, while I'm at it, send us a self-addressed uh, stamped envelope, a number 10 size self-addressed stamped envelope to this address, Ralph, R-A-L-P-H. We're going to make it easy on you. P.O. Box 536. That's Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona. 85702. For those of you who don't know much about Arizona, Tucson is spelled T-U-C-S-O-N. Again, send it to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. I'll try to repeat this again before the end of the program, but it will be on the hotline number. Uh, if you missed it, call the hotline and you can get this address. Send for this catalog. Uh, Ralph has written some wonderful books, The Unseen Hand, The New World Order. He has produced a lot of videotapes. They're all in here. He has graciously consented to give us a small percent of whatever uh, you purchase to help us in, in our research and to keep this radio show going um, and, and just generally help out here with the, with the finances that we need. So when you order products from Ralph Epperson, you will also be helping out the hour of the time and the Citizens Agency Joint Intelligence. So please do that. Let's go, Ralph. I know okay. you got a lot of other exactly. good stuff. We're going to keep going. Right. This is once again from page 181 of The Secret Destiny of America by Manley Palmer Hall. He said, quote, there is only one possible origin for these symbols. And he's talking about the symbols in the Great Seal of the United States. And that is the Secret Society's pearl, which came to this country 150 years before the Revolutionary War. Now, let's stop right there. I've got two paragraphs, two quotes to read on this particular page, but let's just stop right there. If you take 1776 mm -hmm. minus 150, you're back to around the early 1600s, 1626, mm -hmm. when our, the pilgrims came to this country. That's correct. So what he's saying, we could argue all day about the, about the pilgrims, but what he's saying is that even if we can see those were decent, God-fearing men, at the same time they came, these secret societies came to America for what purpose? to create a secret destiny in the United States. And they're the ones who designed the Great Seal of the United States. Let me continue with the second part of that quote on page 181 of The Secret Destiny of America. He said, The Great Seal was directly inspired by these orders of the human quest, and that it set forth the purpose for this nation, as that purpose was seen and known to the Founding Fathers who are the ones who put the Great Seal together in 1782. Can you start to understand what we're talking about, Bill? I'm sure you know what I... You know what oh, I mean. yeah. In fact, I know when Columbus uh, set sail and discovered America, and he had three ships, the, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, he bore on the sails of his ships the device of the Knights Templars, the red... Maltese yeah, cross. cross, and that was the symbol of the Knights nice Templars. He also planted a Templar flag on the beach of the mm -hmm. first beach that he landed on as, as mm -hmm. the symbol of the society that, that he represented. He also represented, we know, the uh, Order of the Quest called the Order of the Golden Fleece or the Jason Society. And, uh, and, and we found historical connections with, between him and Sir Francis Bacon and many other people. By the way, you mentioned the Jason Society. Yes. Yeah. I do not know this. This is my interpretation of that name. Mm -hmm. uh, in June and December of each year, the sun appears to start to come back uh, from its uh, journey to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, June through December. June 22nd to the 25th of December. Of uh, the 25th of June and the 22nd to the 25th of uh, December. If you take the months between those various dates, 
July, August, September, October, November, you get J A S O N. Mm -hmm. So Jason, then I believe, I, mean, I don't know, this is my, my own opinion, stands for the six months, or the actually five months, July, August, September, October, November, J A S O N, for the five months when the sun is in its hi hierarchy coming back to mankind. That's correct. And if you didn't have so much stuff there to go through, and if you weren't the guest, I, I could spend a, a few hours yeah. just on the meaning. Of the uh, of of Jason and his search for the golden fleece, yeah. this is all it has to do with the call to the secret societies and the search for the ultimate. Well, I'm not going to go into it. That's that's another program. Okay. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> okay. if, if I get started, I won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing about this, Bill, and, and I'm, I know you know this as well as I do. This material is so overwhelming. It's everywhere around us. It's not one book or two. It's hundreds and literally thousands of research. It's there. All we got to do is find it. That's right, and it's more interesting than any trip to Disneyland, than yeah. any novel that anybody could possibly ever write. And I just can't understand when I see somebody sitting down, reading a novel, learning nothing, filling their head with, with junk, uh, and they could be really researching the real history of the world and what really makes things work. And this is so interesting and so exciting. And, and then have the knowledge that it takes to take us out of their control where we can have some real say in our own destiny and determine the future of the world. And it just makes me sick that, that people don't understand this. They think that the fantasy book they're reading is, is, uh, is really good. They don't understand that nobody in this world has an imagination that can beat the real situation yes, exactly. in the world. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The next uh, quote I want to re re, uh, refer to is from a book entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, written by Benjamin Cream. Benjamin Cream is, as you know, Bill, running around the United States and I think probably Europe as well, talking about the appearance of the man that he calls the Christ, Lord Maitreya. And uh, this is a book that talks about Lord Maitreya and his, quote, reappearance, unquote. I want to read now from pages 28 and 29. Here's what he says. In every age, teachers have come forth from the spiritual center to enable mankind to take its next evolutionary step. All perfect men in their time, all sons of men who became sons of God for having revealed their innate divinity. They are the custodians of a plan for the evolution of humanity and the kingdoms of nature. This plan works out through the agency of the esoteric, meaning concealed, hierarchy of masters, who substand all world events and constitute the invisible because unknown governments of the planet. So here he's saying, once again, there's a plan at work. Who's behind it? These ancient initiates who have come forth to save us uh, and save mankind. Now, when he talks about the sons of God, he's really talking about the sons of light, and the light is Lucifer, and their God is Lucifer. And when they talk about God, they are not talking about the God that Christians and the followers of the prophet Muhammad and many other people in this earth consider to be God. That's correct. Okay, once again now, let's now uh, uh, start examining who this uh, hierarchy is. On page 181 of his book, entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, Benjamin Cream says this, Marxism, meaning communism, Karl Marx, is not only a narrow economic theory, it is to do with the basics I'm sorry, it's the basic. Let me start over again. Marxism is not only a narrow economic theory, it is to do with the basic laws of mankind's nature and interrelationship. Man is one. That essentially is what Marx is saying. Here's a man praising Karl Marx. And I'll tell you why in a minute. He's saying that this hierarchy is based on communism, Marxism. And I'm going to prove that again in a few more. In fact, in the next quote. On page 180 of the same book, The Reappearance of the Christ, he says this. Uh, here he's answering a question asked of him by someone interviewing him. He says, the author, the uh, questioner says, the interviewer says to Mr. Cream, you mentioned that Marx was working for the hierarchy. Now, who's the hierarchy? The group leading this, uh, this plan. That's correct. That's the leaders of the secret societies, plural, who are bringing about the New World Order. And here's Mr. Cream's answer, quote, page 180 of the reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom. He says, quote, Marx was indeed a member of the hierarchy. So here he's admitting that Karl Marx is inside the inner circle of those planning our future in this new world order, this uh, secret uh, teachings, you name it. Now, Senator, Senator Joseph McCarthy was actually right 
in what he felt was happening to this country and that we'd been infiltrated and were being destroyed from within. He just didn't know what to call it, did he? That's correct. Well, Joseph McCarthy, was as long as he was talking down into the Communist Party and saying there are communists that work in America, he was praised as a great American hero. Mm -hmm. you, anyone that does that, if you attack Angela Davis and Ben, and ben what's his name, Gus Hall, you're a great American. But the problem with McCarthy is he looked up and saw the connection between the government people and these communists. And that's when he got into trouble. He looked up. Don't look up. Look down. Well, that was his whole purpose, was to say that these people not only exist, and their goal is to create a worldwide communist government, but they're in our government, and I know who they are. That's right. And they, that's when they had to beat and destroy it. I cover this in my book, The Unfamiliar. Folks, I think that's the real reason James Forrestal committed suicide, because... He was initiated into the 33rd degree of Freemasonry and then began to find out who the others were and what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, he didn't really commit suicide, folks. He was thrown out that window. Yes, I believe that's true. I cover that in my book as well. Let's talk about that briefly. Forstall was indeed right in the middle of this thing. You're that's right. He was an international banker, had become the first Secretary of Defense, and he apparently, during the meetings at Yalta, Potsdam, and Turan, started to see what was going on in this world. And you're right, Bill. I commend you for saying that. He started to figure out, and within days of that, he was keeping diaries, by the way. That's right. He was fired by Truman. Yes, fired by Truman, and then picked off the streets of Washington, D.C., and taken to Bethesda and labeled, quote, insane, unquote. That's right. And, then, and, and they, they had no authority to do that, by no, the way. No, there's no one. They, they, they had no, no authority whatsoever. No. They confined him to the middle ward of Bethesda uh, Naval Hospital. Same place, by the way, where they took Richard Nixon. Yeah. And uh, Nixon, and, by the way, mentioned that if he, if he went to Bethesda, he'd never come out alive. Right? Remember that when he had this... <coughs> pleurisy in his leg. That's right. And uh, when he finally held a press conference at Bethesda, he, he told the members of the press corps there, he said, if it weren't for you guys, I'd be dead. That's his exact words. Okay, let's, I'm going to skip by the next few quotes because I think that's, uh, we're, we probably are getting close to the end of this program. We'll, if we have time, we'll get into this thing about Hiram Abiff and, and, uh, and some of these writers. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I, I had to cut you off here, but we're going we're gonna to be back tomorrow night. Can you be back tomorrow night? Yeah, I'll be back tomorrow night. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, we've got to go, folks. Uh, don't forget, send a self-addressed stamp number 10 envelope to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Once again, Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. If you order anything from the catalog, folks, please specify that you listen to the hour of the time so that uh, we will get a small percentage to help us with our efforts and to keep this show going. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being such good listeners out there. Remember, take these references that we get you, give you and look them up. Good night, and God bless you all. <laughs>